Jeff. Let me, uh, actually, I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and introduce Jeff while, while we're loading up his presentation. Um, Jeff Curry is a, is a, a folklorist. Oops. He studies at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, he is completing a master's thesis on, um, can, I, can I share that? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Jeff is completing a thesis on uh, uh, Lumbee sheet, sheetrock workers uh, the, from the, the Lumbee Indian tribe in eastern North Carolina, mm -hmm. south, south of Carolina. Yeah. So um, uh, he's working on that, and so he's branching out out of, out of his Indian studies into, uh, into Balas. He befriended Balas about, about two years ago, and he's been yeah. talking with him over time. And uh, he's, in addition to his interviews with Balas, Jeff also runs the day-to-day the, the -day operation at the conservation shop. So the, the repairs that are now underway uh, at the shop are, done, are being done under, uh, under Jeff's guidance. He's been the, the registrar for, for the project, has worn many, many hats, and, and will wear many in the future as well. Uh, the, the registrar is handling doc documentation of, as you can imagine, more parts of things than you can ever dream. So I, at that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to keep my phone up here so I know what time I'm working with. Um, as Dennis said, yeah, I wear a few hats of the project, um, documentation, collections, uh, manager. Um, I, a couple years ago, I started working with Volus through an Arts Council grant from the State Arts Council, and uh, I was doing some contract folklore work, and one of the reasons um, I was really drawn to the project is kind of, uh, yeah, I've been working with Lumbee Sheetrockers and I'm interested in labor and how people make a living and how people, how culture surrounds that. And this is what drew me because I, I feel like a lot of Volus's work um, uh, comes out of his history of labor. And uh, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit during this. Um, as well as just working with Volus. Um, first off, I want to just talk about how I approach things and working with Volus. Um, these are kind of my rules to live by. Uh, uh, listen, pay attention, communicate um, with him, uh, with other people in the project, self-awareness of how I'm going about this, transparency with him, uh, commitment to the project, to Volus, um, self-evaluate, um, humor which I think some people forget, you know, it's fun. <laughs> um, have grace and have humility. Um, this is kind of how I go about working um, as a folklorist and on other projects I've done over the years. Um, and then working with Volus. Uh, in this, I'm gonna just go through um, just different things that have come out of working with Volus and answering questions as well as um, some of his life history as well as the work itself. Um, but how I go about working with Volus um, specifically is in interviews, I kind of had, uh, for probably the first three months, I didn't throw a recorder on him, I just talked and, and tried to just figure out who he was, let him figure out who I am. Um, um, and, and, and so that's more the informal. And continuing now, I mean, he knows I, I always tell him I have the recorder and everything, but you know, the recording is, mostly low key um, in trying to get the stories and the history and, and um, what the World Leagues are about, what he's about. Um, and, but I also do some formal interviews whenever I am really concerned about a piece or we have specific questions that we want answered. Um, in visits, uh, I can't get any work done, which is what Bala says a lot. He's 93 years old and he works pretty much every day. Um, He's continually making pieces. Um, he's, uh, you know, I'll go up and he's welding or he's grinding or he's cutting metal. Um, he doesn't walk, uh, his legs are getting a little shaky on him, his knees are giving out, he is 93. But I keep that in my mind that he wants to work and so I schedule um, times when I do want to record or ask him something um, or take pictures about uh, around his schedule and what he wants to do. Um, family, if you need Vala's call Jean. Jean is his wife, and she sets his schedules, and anytime people, I've been kind of a liaison with Vala's and the family, and other people who want um, to interview him, or work with him, or talk with him, and uh, tour around, and, and, and the project in Vala's. And so I've kind of gotten 
pretty close to Gene as well, and his daughter and one of his sons, another son who um, I'm not as, I, I don't know as well, but um, the family and I have gotten close over this time in the project. Um, images, nobody wants to have a camera stuck in their face every time they see you, so I don't take pictures every time I talk to him. Um, I do have a camera in the car in case something comes up, but I try not to be completely invasive into his life, you know, just invading every moment. Um, so starting out, while it's growing up, um, Wilson, as um, Dennis mentioned, Wilson was the world's greatest tobacco market, in case you didn't know, and people in eastern North Carolina will let you know. This is Fluker Tobacco in North Carolina, and Wilson Tobacco is king and queen. This is the king and queen. During the annual tobacco festival, which has been transitioned because of the down uh, turn in tobacco production into the World League Festival. Um, and from field, uh, Volus worked growing up in, in the fields in Wilson in, on his family's land um, to the barn. This is actually stringing or tying tobacco to put in to cure in the barn. Um, to the auction, and this uh, tobacco auctions, now the way they do it, it's all through contracts, but back in the day, Volus used to work in tobacco warehouses during the time when it went to auction and things were sold. This is one of the massive warehouses in downtown Wilson that's now been torn down. It's called Smith's Warehouse, but another warehouse called the High Dollar is part of the project and where a museum site would go, an indoor space. Um, oops. How do I click? Okay, there we go. So I just want to give you a touch of tobacco auctioning. This is speed rigs for those of you who might remember. I'm not getting anything. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'll just move on. Uh, moving structures. Uh, Volus grew up uh, farming, as I mentioned, but he also moved uh, buildings with his father. His father moved uh, barns, houses, bridges, other structures. And in Volus' work in life, this is uh, Parker's Barbecue, which is a really famous barbecue place in uh, Wilson, North Carolina, which was a place people stopped after tobacco market. and. Uh, in moving structures, he learned a lot of the, the skills that he, he used later in making his artwork as well as, um, um, as, well as uh, just in his own business working life, um, engineering mechanics as well as creativity. You know, Volus has talked a lot about how um, you have to be creative in order to move a house. Um, it's going to present you problems continually. So, um, and I hope this plays, but then um, Volus is, a, the left arrows are Lucommon. This is 1930 above and 1940 below. And this is a short piece about how Volus is talking about when he was a young kid, he went with his father um, down to um, work on a road. They had to move buildings and stuff back from the highway between Plymouth and what's called Little Washington or the original Washington down east. Um, yeah, I'm clicking. I can, I can do this. <laughs> I'll just, um, yeah. Is the sound up? Volume? Because it's playing. Is there a sound cord that needs to be plugged? Oh, there it is. I'm going to go back. Plymouth to Little Washington, there used to be a dirt road. Yeah, 
we used to be in miles. We moved all the houses and everything that was in the way of the right of way, pull out all those bridges. The, uh, the state had to put us to work most of the time on kind of dead weather and roofs and bears. We uh, camped at Aiken Station, about high way, the railroad. Right here. Plane came through here once in a while, a right. crossroad. And uh, my dad said, we built a house for you, built, built one house. We had about 15, 14 or 15 hands. We were getting too heavy. We rented a place for some of them. And we stayed down and come home every weekend. How old were you then? I was small for my daddy to rent a little boy. Somebody had was in Johnson County and had a boy my age. And uh, he let him stay with me down there. He me something where we stayed at the house for the grid and had moved the house. Did your brother step out too with your daddy or did you go for one? I got a one. Yeah. And down there then, and boy, fire for everybody fire hunting it. And the people all up and down the road they had fires and little cubs in the back of barn in the building. Yeah. And you could hear them not putting corn, the fire. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So I saw somebody come up here been too long ago uh, from Hyde County. And I told him, I said, is any birds down there? He said, yeah, there's a few. I said, how about bird trap here? I said, if you can find any down there, buy them, and, and I'll pay you, I'll give that water bottle. I'd have to have four or five. I said, I'll take some of these son of a bitch's legs out. <laughs> but I, he said, I'll check it over like that word. Um, I let it go on a little bit. He's talking about bears and trying to get bear traps to as he puts a cut some folks' legs. Um, Volus has had a problem over the years of because he collects metal to make his pieces of people stealing from him. And um, he has uh, uh, fought back somewhat and, uh, and patrolled the land and the whirly gigs and continually for about 35 years, and his family has as well. And people keep an eye out. Uh, it's a place that people want to go um, to drink sometimes and hang out and and people who, especially when metal prices have gone up, people have stole a lot of metal from him over the years. So it's it's a point where he it, it upsets him, and uh, and but Vols doesn't lay down for anybody. So um, another thing that's been talked about a lot is uh, Vols in World War II, and he's talked about Saipan and being on Saipan, and people bring up um, as evidence um, he he. Uh, built a whirly gig, a windmill, when he was in um, the war. This is not Volus. Uh, this is pictures that I found of, it was quite a common thing for people of Guadalcanal, uh, Saipan, and other places to build windmills to wash clothes. And these are some plans I also found uh, for those types of windmills. Um, Volus kind of skirts the issue every time I ask him about it, and uh, this is, You'll hear him, um, this is another little recording, where he doesn't talk about the windmills, but he talks about something else that he built when he was on Saipan um, during the war. And the war influenced him. He loves airplanes. He was on a flight line, and airplanes um, would come and go um, all the time. And uh, a lot of his uh, work, um, kind of, you can see that influence and in the love for airplanes. He um, that he has in his pieces. Some uh, are planes, and then some just look like parts and pieces from planes. Oh, I'm gonna go back down. Um. I look after that after the war I even give up, I look after the mess hall. Get the motor going, guys, and then get the camera going. Everybody on the machine, you feel the washing machine when you're doing it. How did you do it? Can you explain it to me? Japanese folks come in, we keep off for a mile and come in every one night. Great guy, look like an antiper cell phone, about like that. Mm -hmm. He got 16 planes. We had them here ready to go to Bum, Japan. Come in there and raise them. I don't like it was a And they were loaded with fuel and bones. You talk about a war zone now. They, they got 16 of them. And we put them all in the, between the, in the middle of the runway. So every time they come in, they'd be re-bombed. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I got I got one of them on boaters at home. Little four children mowing about that long. Cutest little thing you've ever seen in your life. I got one on the house and put in a heavy duty bicycle. And it was a run thirty miles an hour with two on it. That was like the wall boat. Yeah. Well, before he just a little bit before it gave up. And old Carl stopped me one day and said, Bob Sanson, what in the hell you got there? And I told him, I told him I'd get the motor out when the red thing. He said, listen, wait a minute. He said, that damn motor game, they tell you what that thing called. He said, you got to take that stuff. I had to take that. He called me to take that stuff out. And uh, I went and signed out for a... Uh, Single engine one, uh, uh, like a like, wet, like a naked welding, tell us I'm a machine. Right. And I took the damn generator for it off and that back and that damn bicycle. We had welded on a shock over there. Yeah. And we had that thing on there. Yeah. And uh, it was like a little bit of a little bit So I asked him about the washing machines and he kind of went to the motorcycles and I thought a lot about this and every time he, he kind of will tell the motorcycle story before he'll tell the washing machine. Um, and I think one of the reasons and when I found out that it was a fairly common thing is that a lot of people were building washing machines you know, out of windmills but not too many people were building motorcycles um, out of spare engines and bicycle frames. And if you, a lot of his work later on, you see a lot of bicycles being used, and, and uh, he has actually put um, um, engines on some. But uh, so in talking with Wallace, um, he will, you know, just just kind of steer me in different directions. Um, a lot of people would approach him like, uh, you know, this is just an old country boy, but Wallace is savvy and has dealt with. Um, um, the media and, and people come in to interview him for 25, 30 years. So he, he kind of knows the game, he knows what he wants to talk about, and he steers me in those directions. But, um, you know, I keep asking questions to try to get to other issues that, you know, I'm curious about and um, uh, want, want to know. Um, after he worked, um, he farmed, he did, he owned the uh, repair shop, he also moved buildings, um, he also moved metal and um, he had he built tow trucks out of um, uh, uh, um, army surplus trucks and would uh, weld on cranes and, and other implements on the back. Um, he built this piece late 70s, early 80s. This is the first one. He said he'd been thinking about it. Um, and it's it's not a windmill uh, in, in the traditional sense. And and you see the just the different parts and pieces that he has on it. Um, uh, some of these are like lights off of um, off of cars. Some are just regular commercial reflectors. He also has a few reflectors from road signs on there. Um, after he started putting these pieces up, and over about a 10-year period, about 35 years ago, he put up about 20 to 30 pieces. Um, this is what happened. Uh, people started telling a legend similar to this. Well, um, I'll just read it. While at East Carolina University in Greenville, I heard a story about a place called Acid Park. Legend has it one night a girl was on her way home from prom. She dropped a little acid and right after she took the final turn in the road before reaching home, her car ran off the road and wrapped itself around a tree. The girl's grieving father nailed and pasted reflectors to every service around his home in turn where his daughter died. And this is a story, and people refer to the place as Acid Park, and this is a story that's been repeated not just in the community, but in the greater region. That's why Volus started building these things. That's why they're covered with the reflectors. Um, it upsets Volus um, because his daughter's still alive um, and that people are telling stories on him. Um, and in my opinion, the way I've approached the story and the way I think about the story is it's sort of like food safety stories that started popping up in the 50s. You know, um, it, it, it was... Uh, unusual to go to restaurants, fast food restaurants, they weren't around until really the 50s. And people, you started having stories like Kentucky Fried Rats and, and, and people were anxious about where their food was coming from. I think that's pretty much why this story um, came about because people are anxious. Where, why would this guy start putting up 45 foot windmills in the middle of the country all of a sudden after working for 60 some years? Um, it's a, grief is a great explanation for it. Um, 
and it's not the case, but you know, you know, Val was doing it because he was thinking about it because he he grew up in that. Um, he has the engineering, mechanical, and creative ability to do it, and he's an artist um, with metal. Um, it didn't take grief to push him into this. Um, so another thing I look at is the work. Um, uh, I look at materials and paints as well, and we're going to talk about materials some. But um, Valus uh, works at the shop building mostly the small pieces. He does do some work on some of the larger pieces, but as um, Dennis mentioned earlier, the small pieces that he keeps it back in the almost inner sanctum of the shop, um, he builds a lot of those at his shop. He works on still large pieces. He still takes commissions out at his home, which is nearby, um, where he has four or five barns and other shops. Um, tools that he uses, this is his welding. He does a lot of stick welding and his leads on his welder run about 50 feet so that he can stretch all the way around his shop to do welding, big pieces, small pieces. Um, I've seen the leads, as you can see, duct tape together, um, start smoking multiple times. And Valus actually caught himself on fire about, about six, seven years ago now, and that's one of the reasons he slowed down. He actually burned himself pretty bad um, in a welding accident and, uh, um, and it took him a while to recover, and he couldn't do a lot of the maintenance work that he did before the accident. Uh, side grinders, you see here. He cuts out metal reflectors with this, and I'm going to show that in a second. And he's got about 10 or 15 drill presses sitting around. He burns through them, um, constantly complaining they're not built good enough. But Ballas is constantly, you know, drilling in metal. He's always working with metal. Um, windmills, whirly gigs. Uh, one of the things that, you know, people call them whirly gigs, but um, Valis uh, calls them windmills often and, and has referred to them as such. Um, uh, uh, most of the time, you know, he'll kind of laugh and say, they call me an artist, I just build windmills. Um, and this is one of my favorite pieces that he did. It's one of the most uh, complex. Um, other pieces that he did um, that are out at the shop, some close-ups. Um, if, if you can see, like, a lot of this stuff evokes um, airplanes to me. Um, it, it's kind of got, it's almost like engines out of airplanes um, in, in a lot of the pieces is kind of what it looks like. Um, this one I actually thought of like a turbine engine. Um, this one, I mean, naming them, I asked him what he wanted to name them, and he would, he's like, I don't care what you name them. You know, I wanted him to give me names, but oftentimes he's like, I, I don't, I don't, I don't even got a name for it. And so I went through so that we could keep them straight in the project and gave the one on the left, Milkshake America, because it has about, I don't know, about 40 milkshake cups on it, the metal milkshake cups. And the uh, folks in the shop who were working with us thought this looks like a time machine, so we called it that. And I talk about the names that I've given them with Volus. Um, moving the whirly gigs, uh, we use a local sign. Um, uh, sign company to help us move the whirly gigs, uh, stencils. Um, Volus is involved in that and comes out usually when we move. Um, this was actually a pretty rainy day that he was out there on the move. Um, and looking over, and it's interesting to get his reactions when they come down, seeing them um, down on the ground after 30 years um, in the condition. And, and uh, during the project, we keep maintaining the collections. Um, everything that comes off from uh, nails to dirt, <laughs> um, we bag and tag. And one of the things that came about is we tagged this that was sitting in this I-beam right here um, and didn't know where it went. Um, and then we realized in the shop that this tail mechanism that wags the dog's tail, which he put a drive all the way down, um, was missing. And so uh, one of the guys said, well, it's a U-bolt. And I went and looked in the bottom and like, well, we have a U-bolt. Um, so it's good. We save everything. And it's helped out the project, you know, just trying to piece together because sometimes the ground below them is littered with uh, uh, pieces and parts that have fell, fallen off over the years. Um, I'm not going to show this. This is a small video of it because um, I'm running short on time. Um, in the shop, Volus does come by some and talk with us about what's going on, and he informs the project um, in helping us out with materials because Volus has collected materials over the years, um, stockpiled them, in fact. Um, 
And, and so if there's something we can't find, chances are he's got it and um, has barns full of materials. Um, that's him and his wife, Jean. And uh, they both have been in the shop numerous times and, and come by just to see how things are going and what's going on um, in the shop and, and how it's progressing and, and are genuinely happy with how everything is going. Um, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the pieces that are in different museums, he's still building them, he's still working. This is a piece um, uh, that is going to the Cameron Art Museum in, in uh, Wilmington. And one of the things I've noticed is that these large pieces that he um, gets commissions for, they're all in similar in shape, long and narrow, so that he can transport them. So the transportation and setting them up in an offsite kind of dictates. Um, he did get the North Carolina Award uh, recently, and that's his dog, Charlie. I figured I'd throw that in. Volus loves animals. And this is some of the folks, I just want to give a shout out to some of the folks who uh, are working in the shop and helping us to work on Volus's pieces. Um, so that's mechanical and surface, and that's it. That's the last picture I got of Volus on the last move about a week ago. Thank you.